welcome back to the speaker series or welcome for the first time if you are just joining us. My name is Grace Kendall. Uh, and my name is Mike Belsel. And we are from the Tabletop Mentorship Program. We're super excited to be continuing our speaker series where we get amazing people to talk about their experiences in the game industry in all sorts of different facets and areas of experience. Absolutely. Uh, and before we get started, we just want to thank our sponsors who make this all possible. Uh, couldn't be done without the help of New Voices in Gaming and Tabletop Network, uh, as well as everyone who supports us on Patreon, especially uh, Angela Belsall and Curtis Fry. Thank you so much. Couldn't do it without you. Absolutely. So today we are really excited to be talking about one of the most popular board game to topics, Kickstarter. It's something people have a lot of questions about, a lot of interest in, and we thought, who better to talk about the subject than a veteran of Kickstarter, Omari Akil? Welcome. <laughs> How's it going? I don't, I didn't, I never thought of myself as a veteran of Kickstarter until just now. So <laughs> I think if you've survived a campaign, you are officially a veteran of Kickstarter. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So I guess three puts me there, right? <laughs> <laughs> That's right. Congratulations. <laughs> Thanks. Absolutely, yeah. Thank you so much for being here. We are we are really excited for this. We know we have a lot of uh, you know people in our program that are just starting out, and they are you know all gung ho about Kickstarter and like I've got my game and I want to put it up and tomorrow. You know, yeah, tomorrow exactly. <laughs> tomorrow, obviously. Uh, <laughs> right. <laughs> so so we are excited for uh, for this presentation and for some best practices from from someone who knows uh, how to do everything. Um, yeah. Uh, we will have a Q&A at the yes. end, so if you are thinking of questions, you're welcome to put them in the chat as you think of them, uh, and we will make sure that they all get asked by the end of the presentation. Other than that, I think we're ready to go ahead and let Omari take it away. All right, let's do this. Bye. <laughs> hey, everybody. Um, this is pretty exciting. So first, just again, thank you to Tabletop Mentorship Program for just giving me the opportunity to, to, to do this, really. Um, and uh, I guess we're going to talk about how to run a, a Kickstarter um, and survive. And so I added that little piece on. And I, I do I want to apologize first uh, for not getting a description of this talk up um, sooner. Uh, it was tricky actually because I think the topic is so important and I really wasn't sure how I wanted to approach this and how I wanted to talk about it. Um, but where I landed is going to be a little different than what you might expect. Um, but we are absolutely gonna talk about how to run a Kickstarter campaign. And I think in, in a very, very useful and helpful way. So uh, first, a little bit about me. Um, they did describe me as a veteran of Kickstarter. Um, I do uh, own and have co-founded a publishing company with my brother called Board Game Brothers. Uh, and we have done two Kickstarter campaigns for our company, uh, one for Rap Gods, and that was in 2018, and then another one for Hoop Gods in 2020. Um, I also ran a Kickstarter uh, as a co-design uh, with Matt Everhart for the game. Uh, we made a small game called Oh My Gourds. Uh, that was actually my second campaign. Uh, I did that in between the other two. Uh, all three of those were successful. Uh, I put quotes around it in the presentation here uh, for a reason, a reason I'll talk about a little bit later. Um, I'm also the president of the Indie Game Developer Network, uh, who is an organization that really strives to help support uh, game designers, uh, small publishers, uh, and even some like freelance designers and artists just kind of break into the industry. Uh, and hopefully we can support them in breaking out and becoming bigger and better in the industry as well. Uh, I also do content creation. Um, you can access and find some of that via Tabletop Backer Party. And I am a Twitch streamer. Uh, I try to focus on game design in that, uh, in that world. Uh, but all of those things are really just, uh, you, you'll kind of get a sense of why all those things are important and useful to me in terms of running a Kickstarter, the more we talk about this. Uh, so moving on, let's just talk about tabletop game Kickstarter first. Um, right now, I just did a search. There are 335 live projects currently, uh, and that's including tabletop RPGs. There's not an easy way to separate that with the search. Um, but 
just in talking to um, you know some of the folks at Kickstarter, I think we all have a pretty good understanding that board games are one of the hottest things that exist on Kickstarter. Their success rates are above average compared to almost all of the other categories on Kickstarter. So it is a place where you can find success. And so I, I'm going to talk about a lot of the challenges, a lot of the hurdles, a lot of things that can get in your way. But I do want to kind of start out by saying it is a very, very, very useful and viable platform and option for you to publish games. Um, so let's get started. I'm going to uh, basically try to help you to answer these three questions. And I think um, I'm, I'm going to approach it in a slightly different way. And I really want to approach it in, in, a, in a really real way, in a really um, kind of human-centered way. I think a lot of the pieces of running a Kickstarter campaign that get lost and the challenges that you face in that space are, are not necessarily logistical. They're not necessarily, well, there's plenty of those challenges too. Uh, a lot of them are, are very human challenges and understanding those and getting over those obstacles are gonna be the things that I think will help you become most successful in terms of running a Kickstarter campaign. So question number one, <laughs> what is your goal? What is your goal? What is your goal for your Kickstarter campaign? And the first thing I will say is that I am absolutely not talking about the funding goal. The funding goal is a small piece of the puzzle, honestly. Um, it's, it's, it's easy to get caught up on that when you're starting out uh, just starting out because honestly, it's one of the scariest parts because it it does determine whether on Kickstarter you become successful and funded and you're you you feel like you're able to continue. But that is not always the goal. And so I really want to start out by by just suggesting that you ask why you're running a Kickstarter. And the answer can be all over the place. I I can tell you. Personally, for me, I put a couple of options on here. Maybe it's just a passion project. Maybe this is just something you've been working on for a long time. You really want to get it out, out the door. You really want to get it on some people's tables. You may not have the same aspirations for that game as somebody else who is starting a publishing company. Like I was starting a company and I had a bigger purpose than just releasing one game. And the reason this question is so important is that your, basically your campaign might look very, very, very different just based on what the answer to that question is. Um, if, if it's just a passion project, if this is the one thing that you care about and you just want to produce that game and it doesn't matter to you, how you get there, you know, you might be able to throw caution to the wind and approach Kickstarter in a very haphazard way. And you may have a couple failed campaigns, but ultimately you will find success if you're learning throughout that entire process and you'll be able to release your game. Passion project complete, moving on, you could check the box off and then that's it. Um, but that might not be the case. Um, and I know specifically for, for myself and my brother and our company, what we talked about very, very, very early on was that we wanted to run a Kickstarter campaign to learn the industry. That was our real goal. We knew we wanted to make games and we knew that we also just learned so much better by, by just doing and sometimes failing. Uh, and sometimes having missteps, which we had a lot of. And, but we knew that was how we could really learn the industry. And we forced ourselves to kind of take care of as much of the process with just the two of us. So we had a better understanding of that. Yes, we funded successfully. Yes, we were able to publish our game, but the value that our first campaign really, really, really brought to us was how much we got to learn and understand the inner workings of the industry. And so again, this that that's why I think this question is one of the most important. Um, and I've seen lots of different potentials, possibilities there too. 
I also put one on here about building towards another Kickstarter. I know several people who I've talked to, especially new designers, and they have really big games that they have in their brains and they're, and they're working on. But a lot of times the advice that I give them is that, you know, that big game is going to require so much more effort and more work in terms of building a community, in terms of understanding the logistics uh, and the cost associated with a big game versus a small game. And maybe you th get a game together that's smaller, that you feel good about. It, it might not be the big one, the one that you care the most about, but you can do a smaller campaign to learn about the industry a little bit, of course, uh, but also it'll help build your brand. It'll help build your your some momentum and basically show people that you can you can do this successfully basically to set up whatever that next campaign is so that's really why i i, I want to focus and say that this question is so important because it will drive everything about your campaign if you approach it the right way uh including what your video looks like what your campaign layout looks like we'll talk more about that a little bit um but but I think first and foremost, you have to answer that question. What is your goal? Uh, now, once you have an answer to that, now how do you reach it? Um, and I think for most people, when they think about a, a, a Kickstarter talk, talking about how you run a Kickstarter, this piece that I'm about to describe is, is probably what you think of and what you think about. Um, I'm probably going to spend the least amount of time here because I think this is the place where if you're new to the industry, you can find out most of what you need watching some YouTube videos, scouring some of the uh, other, other places where there's resources and people talking about Kickstarter. Um, and that's, and, and I'll just, I describe these as the basics. Because to me, it's like the core of what Kickstarter is. You have to do the math to figure out your funding goal. And there's formulas for that. And there's a lot of people who have a uh, different methodology for determining what the funding goal should be. But ultimately, that is going to be something that is very personal. So, and again, it goes back to what is your goal? Is your goal to, if your goal is to, have a game that you produce more copies of than let's say the number of backers you have and and you intend on going to conventions and selling those maybe you add convention travel and expenses into your funding goal as long as you're upfront i think about that and as long as you're you're kind of letting backers know that this is the the money that i'm asking for and looking for and you put that out there I, I think it's reasonable to structure and, and create a funding goal that works for you specifically based on what your goals are. Um, so do the math and set your funding goal based on that. Um, I would even say for us, um, as, as first time we were running a campaign, we, we were interested, like I said before, in learning the industry. And what that meant to us is that we... We needed a successful campaign when it comes to the funding goal. So we set our goal basically at a number that we felt like we could reach, even though we needed probably, I would say, 30% more than our actual funding goal to sell our, to actually produce our game. But we knew we were comfortable covering some of those costs on our own because our goal was not the money to get funded necessarily, it was to learn the industry, right? So taking all of those things into account, we probably set our funding goal lower than what somebody else might have done in the same situation or for the same type of game with the same number of components and the same cost to, to deliver. Um, so just think about that when you're setting your funding goal. Obviously, you don't want to put yourself in a bad situation, but know that what your actual goal is not associated with that funding goal ha can have a great impact on what that funding goal actually is. Um, the other thing you want to do, obviously, is you want to have an attractive campaign video and page layout. And there are so many, I can't stress this enough, 
there are so, so many amazing, amazing examples of this on Kickstarter. Kickstarter is the most fantastic resource for getting inspired and trying to figure out how you want to structure your page, how what type of video you want to do. And there are so many different examples of all different types and all different strategies that, yeah, you you might as well go on Kickstarter and use that as sort of a template to find the things that you love about Kickstarter videos, the things that you hate about page layouts, and use all of that information to craft something that feels like your own. And you can use basically just use Kickstarter to do that. Uh, next, creating an effective pre-launch and pre-launch launch and post-launch plan. Um, and this is this is honestly one of the most difficult pieces. And when I talk about a plan, I'm talking about everything from uh, the the marketing. Uh, so social media posts through all of these phases. I'm talking about making sure that you have your your um, content lined up. So making sure you get that out to previewers or reviewers, whatever the case may be, there's all of those things that need to happen before you launch. There's a plethora of things that need to happen during your launch. Uh, make sure you give yourself plenty of time to um, use some of the tools that are available too. So now we have pre-launch pages where people can click follow and like they get a tiny preview of the campaign and you're able to basically gauge how many people are interested in your game. You could do that over however long you want. Um, I would say between six to nine months for that process is probably kind of standard, but you are obviously welcome to do way more than that um, and plan out you know, a year or more than a year to get all these pieces in play. Uh, and then post-launch posting updates, um, making sure that you are in communication with all of the logistical partners that you might have. Um, there's there's just so much there. But if you create an effective plan for it, then I think you can be successful. Uh, and I will say that there are also some guides and resources for that too. Um, it, you can look at... Um, Kickstarter itself also. So you can even, you know, if you're curious about how often people normally do updates, go and find a bunch of Kickstarters that look similar to yours. Look at their update schedule. Look at the content that they put in their updates. I can't stress enough how useful Kickstarter is itself as a tool for crafting your own Kickstarter campaigns. Uh, and as far as launch plans and things like that, uh, I would say Gaming with Edo, uh, Eduardo Bereff has created a really nice um, actual spreadsheet. Uh, it's a Google Sheet that anybody can have access to. There's a video where he talks about creating that plan and using that spreadsheet. Uh, so that one is, is also in a very, very, very useful resource for getting that plan nailed down. Um, I will say, and I, I find that because uh, the, the the gaming industry has kind of exploded and because we've had so many new people entering into the industry, um, there's a lot of Kickstarter groups out there that are sort of like poised to offer advice and for people to come in and ask advice. That's just a place you want to be very careful. Uh, and I say you want to be careful mainly because you never really know Sometimes people provide context and, and, and more information about who they are and where they come from when they're giving and offering that, that kind of advice. But it's often very, very, very hard to tell. Um, so just always be thinking critically about the advice that you get in places like that, like Facebook groups, um, and, and understand that all feedback is not created equal, all advice is not created equal, and just try to understand how to pick and choose what's gonna be most effective, again, for you and your campaign and your goals specifically. Um, so that it requires a little bit more effort to go that route. I know it seems easy. You just go in there and ask a question and you get a bunch of advice. But I think sometimes that can be misleading and, and sorting through that and actually figuring out what of that is useful to you and what isn't um, can, can be harder sometimes. So it, it just depends on the question. It depends on the, the people who are 
you know, available to respond at the moment that you happen to post that question. Uh, so just be wary of that. Uh, and also, this is Tabletop Mentorship Program. Uh, utilize your mentors, because if anything, a mentor who does not have the answer can at least point you to someone, in most cases, who is trusted and knowledgeable and can provide probably more targeted advice uh, to you than, than just randomly like asking a question on a Facebook group. So keep all those things in mind. And, and I think that is how all the like basic pieces of the puzzle that'll help you reach your goal. Uh, but there's a lot more to that. Um, the, the second thing that you absolutely need to do is utilize your community. Um, and if you don't have one, you're going to need to build one. And I say that because we're, we're in our industry, you know, we have been so supported, I think, largely by each other, uh, especially in the hobby space in terms of sharing content and, and hyping each other up and, and spreading the word when these campaigns come out, um, that you want to have a solid base for that to happen. And I don't, I, I don't want to put a number on it. Um, there's a lot of people that you know ha have have very specific numbers about if you want to have a successful campaign, you need you know um, if you need a hundred backers, then you need basically a thousand people in your community. So you have you know that ten percent turnover uh, or, or conversion potentially, and that's that that would be great. Um, but those numbers aren't necessarily cut and dry. They're great estimates. They're great to get you where you need to get. But you can also have a smaller community and do very well if you know how to utilize that community, if you know how to mobilize the people in your community to spread the word more effectively than you can. That's largely why we have been successful. Our email list is probably five times smaller than it should be. Con considering the number of backers that we have. Um, and it's not something that we use heavily. It's something that we use around our Kickstarter. We don't use it uh, too much in between that. But because we have found other ways to mobilize the people who are in support of us, we, we don't have to depend on those raw numbers uh, to, to do everything to have a successful campaign. Uh, the third thing, that will help you to reach your goal is to be yourself and be consistent. And I did not understand the importance of this specifically until we were almost at the point of, of launching our first campaign. Um, and I have learned an incredible amount since then in terms of just finding a voice uh, to speak from that resonates with people. Uh, this is gonna be one of the best tools that you have for community building, if you are trying to do that, is finding your voice uh, and also being consistent. And consistent can look like a lot of things. Um, what I would point you to uh, is one of the previous speaker series videos, Danny Quash talked about social media uh, and community building and, and, and marketing. And that video, if you really want to know more about how to um, build yourself, your brand and around who you are. And, and again, consistency being one of the keys there, and Danny is fantastic at that. Uh, you can definitely do that and um, build your community that way. But ultimately, that voice is going to translate into everything else, into your your campaign text that's on the page, it's gonna it, it should translate into the style of the campaigns. Like, what are you bringing from yourself to your campaign page and the style of your campaign page? Um, of course, it needs to relate and be aesthetically connected to the game itself, but you should bring a lot of yourself to the table too. Um, and, and again. Go watch Danny talk about that because it's way better than I would be at that part. Um, and, and you'll learn a ton and it'll probably give you a, gr a good boost towards, uh, again, leading up to a successful campaign. Uh, now this next one is a little bit tricky and I think it's also very important. Um, and that's to challenge the status quo of, of, and I mean that in the sense of what do board games look like on Kickstarter? 
Uh, I think there's a lot of people who are doing this, who are who are challenging it in a lot of different ways in terms of the types of rewards that they that they have set up, the types of stretch goals that they have set up, how they utilize updates. Um, you can do things very differently and find additional success in that. Um, I I I um did a, a, a recently i did a video for bloodstone in in their campaign this is skybound games uh they actually had a fantasy novel as a part of their campaign an entire book uh talking that that really builds out the lore and the story of what their game brought to the table and while that campaign was canceled what i think it does is it i think i think all of us seeing that we got to learn more about what people expect in the industry in terms of, of what they're getting for their money. We got to learn a lot about how different media can play into how people perceive a campaign, into how people uh, perceive a game even. And I think there's so much value there. And personally, myself, I hope that someday soon we get a highly successful campaign that includes a novel with it or includes a comic with it. I, I think that ultimately, like those things, those are the things that are gonna build our industry into something more fun, more interesting, more unique. And I wanna see more of that happening in campaigns. If you're just starting out, this is might not be the piece that you, harp on that you spend a lot of time and energy on kind of changing the expectations and changing the landscape but i absolutely think you should be thinking about it because it's not especially if you're not just doing one campaign if you plan on doing more campaigns then it's going to be extremely important i think just to be considering again because this is also something that's going to set you apart and hopefully it's setting you apart in a way that's attractive to people and attractive to, to gamers who uh, see something unique, see something different. And if you can tie that, 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 that difference that you're bringing to the table to who you are and what you care about, it all starts to click. That was one of the, the most, I think, successful components of our original Rap Gods campaign uh, is that me and my brother, we are very community focused, community oriented people. We love giving back. So having a, a reward tier in that campaign that where somebody could purchase a game for themselves, but also purchase a game to be donated to a library or community center, not only did it do something slightly different, but it also spoke to us and who we are and who our company uh, or what our company was trying to do and what we were trying to be in the industry. So if, if you can link all of those pieces and link all of that to your ultimate goal for your Kickstarter campaign, you're, you're looking at like huge benefit, I think. Um, but it does take thinking about Kickstarter in a slightly different way than what is my funding goal? Is my page pretty? And do I have enough people in my mailing list? So the that's really what, what I wanted this talk to be was to kind of expand out from that into what does it actually look like to run a successful campaign? Um, and the last thing, is, the last question that, that I wanna try to help you answer. And a lot of this is gonna be really um, from my personal experience and really from the things that I didn't get or see a lot of advice on. Um, and, and that question is, that what are the, the real challenges that you're going to face? Uh, and I'll start with by saying running a Kickstarter is not fun. It wasn't fun for me. I don't think it's fun for most people, um, but it, it is absolutely rewarding. It's absolutely um, joyful in a lot of ways, the just feeling and seeing the support come through from the community. There's so much to love about it, but I wouldn't call it fun, not in a million years. Um, so so just just be wary of that. Um, what? But you're going to have a lot of challenges. And the first one I just want to talk about a little bit is knowing your own limits. And this is something that's going to be hugely important and and I, not everyone has access to to resources necessarily um, to overcome a lot of their own limitations and their own weaknesses. But at least if you identify them, then you can find tools and and find ways to work around them. Um, so just 
personally, one of my own uh, limitations. And I actually, even today on Twitter, I was kind of uh, having a conversation about this, is I, I personally don't like asking people to support um, or, or buy anything that I make or, or create or I'm trying to sell. And that includes my Kickstarters. It's really, really, really a, a challenge for me to ask for support in that specific way. Hey, support this Kickstarter. Hey, buy this game. It's hard for me to do that. Me, and I didn't really understand it until probably my third campaign. I didn't really understand that that was one of the things that was likely holding back um, my campaign and also just my own personal investment in the campaign because it was so hard to do that. Um, so just understanding that you're going to have some limitations and you're going to have weaknesses. If you are savvy enough, if you have the resources, if you have the community to ask people for help, who can help you in those places where you're weak or you know you have limits, uh, that's hugely, hugely valuable. Um, I, I, I would hope that in most cases, um, if you're asking strangers to do it, you can pay them. Uh, if you're asking friends to do them, then and they know and understand and want to support, sure, that's great too. Um, but just understand that you know this is not fun for most people. It is a lot of work. You know your limits. Know and potentially try to figure out ways to to get around those as it relates to all of the pieces of the Kickstarter campaign everyone has them. For some people, it's shipping. For some people, they just throw their hands up. I don't want to deal with any of the shipping things. Some people are happy to do that, to create the shipping packages, to label, um, you know, get a label maker and send all the games out themselves. More power to them. So just understanding exactly what your limits are and trying to figure out how to find assistance and help and resources to get over that. Um, one of the things that's absolutely going to help you is to stay organized. And staying organized also can mean a lot of different things to a lot of different people. Uh, but I think the reason staying organized is so important is because the intensity and the pace of Kickstarter, very specifically right before you launch and through the campaign, there's so much intensity. There's so much demand on your time and on your energy that you can easily fall into a pattern where you're just responding to things haphazardly, not necessarily with the best care, sometimes at the expense of other things that need to get done, sometimes spending time and energy on things that aren't actually bringing value to the campaign. And if you are well prepared and well organized, you won't fall into some of those pitfalls. You won't fall into some of those patterns, um, and you you may be able to stick to the things that are working, stick to the things that are most effective, and not waste a lot of energy, honestly. Um, and because it's it's <laughs> your energy during a Kickstarter campaign is absolutely going to be pressed. Um, and I don't know if there's any way to avoid that. And I don't, I haven't talked to anyone who has yet. So if you have, just tell them to call me and let me know how they did it. Um, also, keeping the momentum during a campaign is, is another challenge that is incredibly difficult. Um, and I also don't know if there's a, a magic formula to how to do that, but it, it, it does. And it is important that you keep your community engaged. It is important that you keep sort of the the keep the energy that the campaign has up as much as possible. I know the way that Kickstarter curves work is that you have a huge spike in the beginning. They turn into a nice flat table most often uh, for the mid part of the campaign. And then you have a spike at the end. If you can try your best to maintain a lot of the energy that you have in the beginning throughout the entire campaign. You hopefully see some results of that. Um, it, it's absolutely not guaranteed that that curve that happens is very real. Um, if you do want to kind of take a look at that a little more in depth, you can check out um, tools like kicktrack.com. Kicktrack has a graph 
And you can look at past campaigns and you can see how that graph tracks and you will in 90% of them, I'm sure you will see that spike, you'll see the flattening and then you'll see another spike. Um, so pay attention to that. Try your best to work to keep up that momentum and keep it going. And if you're really good at it, you can continue that momentum even until your product is delivered. Um, I've never been able to do that personally, um, but it is kind of because I spend so much energy during the campaign um, and spend so much time thinking about it, leading up to it, um, that it, it's just so intense and, and, and I can... I, I lose sometimes, I lose a lot of energy after the campaign is over because it is so intense. So just a word of warning that it is it is a thing, a real thing that you're going to have to deal with. Um, and last thing I would say is ignoring the haters. It is uh, unfortunate uh, sort of product of just being out in public and, and being vulnerable and putting yourself and your product out there. It's just a natural thing that happens. Is there gonna be people who either dislike something that you're doing in the campaign, dislike something that you're, uh, that the game itself either represents or some of the gameplay mechanics and how they work. You're gonna encounter people who dislike all, almost all of the parts of, of your campaign potentially, and being able to, and ignoring them it might not even be necessarily the word, but you want to be able to address them in a way that is healthy, um, address them in a way that allows you to continue with all of the other stuff, with all of the things that are working, with all of the things that feel good about running a campaign. Um, and and it's a it's an extremely extremely unfortunate reality that if you're a woman or by POC or uh, LGBTQ, if you're a part of any of those communities, the potential for that the, these very unfortunate comments um, and actions, you, you are going to feel a little more of that. And it's, and it's really unfortunate, but it is also the reality that we are in. Um, and so just being aware and just know that these things are potentially coming and they sneak up on you. They, they pop in in the most innocuous ways sometimes, and you just have to kind of take that and, and go with it. Um, so th there's a lot of challenges. I'm not going to lie. Uh, but if you are, again, kind of sticking to the things that are working, if you are organized and you have a lot of those pieces kind of put in place to protect yourself from some of the challenges, uh, then, then you will be much better off. And even if that just means hiring somebody to comb through Facebook comment, comments, uh, just to like sort through and triage and just give you the ones that are most important so you don't have to deal with everything else, do that. Um, like seriously, the, the most important thing that I think I, I want to leave you with is that uh, the Kickstarter campaign shouldn't break you. It should, it should uplift you. It should make you feel better about the things that you're doing and want you to do more in the future. And unfortunately, I think a lot of people come into the industry, have, have awful, uh, experiences running campaigns and they don't come back. Uh, and, and that's absolutely what I don't want. And I absolutely want more people to, to get involved and get involved in a meaningful way, in a unique way, and, and surprise us. And, and I, ultimately, it's just going to make the industry way, way better, I think, personally. Uh, and I will leave you with this on a positive note. You got this. <laughs> Uh, I really do think that Kickstarter is a brilliant platform, uh, especially it's it's sort of come to its own in board games that, you know, if you are one person and you have a game that you want to publish, if you spend the time and energy up front, you can do it. Um, you can do it. You may not do it on the first time. And a failed Kickstarter campaign is honestly not the end of the world. A failed Kickstarter campaign means that you've already been through the process once and now you kind of know how it works and you'll be able to do it better next time. It also means that people saw your campaign and those people, for better or for worse, are now 
a part of your community. If you've done well to hold on to their information, reach out to them, let them know what's going on, why was it canceled? Those are all things that you can you can actually basically springboard from. Um, so I, I don't want you to shy away from, from a campaign or from running a campaign, even if your first one fails. But you do have to kind of accept that and learn from it and move on. Um, and thanks again for, for letting me talk to you. I just realized I'm already at 40 something minutes. Um, and yeah, I, I think if you want to find me or find more information about games, uh, IGDN online, if you're interested in that, this is all my information. And I think we can, we can take some, some questions. Do we have any questions? <laughs> oh, you're muted. There oh. we go. There we go. <laughs> Omari, that was amazing. Amazing. Thank you so much. Uh, yeah, yeah, please. If anyone has any questions, go ahead and throw those in the chat uh, and we'll get them up uh, for Omari to answer. Uh, but yeah, just wanted to thank you. That was really wonderful. Awesome, awesome. I wasn't sure. You know, I I think I wanted to take a really different approach um, because there's 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 a lot of resources out there. Like I said, for for the logistical things, uh, for the planning things, and so 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 frequently we don't talk about the the hard personal elements of running a campaign, and they are personal. And and so you know, I I've struggled. Um, even even right now, I haven't. I have a very overdue Kickstarter update that I have a literal like mental block that that has been keeping me from doing that, and it's related to a whole bunch of different things, and it's unfortunate, but it's there and it's present. Um, and and often people don't talk about how much of an impact. Kickstarters can have on you, on on you personally, on you emotionally, on you mentally, and you know we we have to be able to get out of that somehow, and it's hard work. It's really hard work. Yeah. Well, so uh, all right. So we, uh, when you do a Kickstarter uh, with Board Game Brothers, is it just you and your brother, or do you have other people that are involved with the actual campaign? You know, keeping track of messages mm -hmm. and all that stuff, updates. Uh, the first two campaigns have essentially been just we're, we're just us mm -hmm. um yeah i was we try to separate the duties as much as possible i was more responsible for some of the marketing things um he was more responsible with some of the logistical things um and and we we try our best uh with just the two of us uh for hoop gods we were able to hire sort of a marketing manager um, she was doing some posting for us. She was doing some of the like campaign content organization. We were still producing most of the materials because um, mm -hmm. you know we we can do the art and the graphic design, but a lot of the the legwork in terms of just getting the word out, um, she was handling for us. And that was the first time we actually had a a, a another person working the the campaign with us. And did you feel that like the relief of like, oh, I don't have to do that. And I feel a lot better because we got absolutely, yeah. absolutely. Um, just putting together a calendar for us for what to post and when. Um, and, you know, again, me and my brother talk about this. Marketing is our weak point. And mm -hmm. so even there, we struggled to like keep up with it. But it was so much easier to have something to work off of instead of just, you know, having to do it on our own, which is developing that plan and creating a good strategy was just so much more difficult for us when we were by ourselves. That's fantastic. And it really speaks to what you what you mentioned earlier about knowing your limits, right? Yeah. And, uh, and and try to find a way to compensate for that. Uh, our questions are starting to roll in. Uh, so uh, let's go to Tanner Simmons. Uh, they have a question here. Have you spent any time looking at other crowdfunding platforms like Indiegogo? Uh, and if so, can you speak to any differences designers should keep in mind if they choose uh, one of those over Kickstarter? Yeah, uh, I have. Um, I I have recommended Indiegogo to some game designers um, who were just starting out, 
who were kind of getting their feet wet uh, in the in the crowdfunding sort of arena. Um, and again, it goes back to their goals. Their goals weren't to release a product and have it be dist widely distributed and be in stores. Their goal was to shape their their game, shape their product into something that felt professional, that felt um, that that felt ready for release. And then they sort of use Indiegogo to work through that. Like they they couldn't necessarily afford like a, a really nice prototype to start out. Um, they they so I I was like, hey, if you do an Indiegogo, something small, build a little bit of support, find kind of you can find your people. You can do a little bit of community building throughout that. Again, you don't have a set funding goal that you have to worry about. So you know you don't necessarily have to have um, uh, yeah, you don't have to meet a goal. You still get some of that money, which you can use to then fuel whatever it is you're trying to do. And maybe down the line, you run a Kickstarter and like relaunch a product um, mm -hmm. on Kickstarter for the first time. Now that you're more established, now that you kind of understand the process better, you've worked out some of that marketing stuff. You can you can just approach it in a very different way, um, and or it may be the case that that you are not using Kickstarter specifically because the the way that the platform works just like doesn't gel with you necessarily. You may like something a little a little cleaner, um, and there are a few cleaner options uh, out there. Uh, so it, again, it goes back to what your goals are. Um, and and really to to find that exact fit. Awesome, uh, that's a great answer. And thank you, Tanner, for that question. Uh, Elena Sanchez uh, wants to know. Uh, I have a question about keeping up the pace, like you mentioned, as a project is moving along. So, how do you post multiple updates without feeling like you're annoying everybody or over self promoting? Uh, which I know that's a challenge for a lot of people. Absolutely. So this is actually what that Twitter uh, conversation was about today. Um, so yeah, if you go go look at some of my stuff, you'll see some of my thoughts on that. Um, but largely, I have I have issue with um, constantly updating um, and constantly uh, sort of yeah, it feels like self promotion, and to me that feels a little gross. Um, so what what I what I try to do is is as much as possible talk about my campaigns kind of on the periphery. Like if I'm doing a lot of, I can I can talk about a lot of things and relate them to what I'm doing or relate them to my product. So that's, that's what we try to do during the campaign a lot of times. Um, so for Hoop Gods, that looked like talking about what's going on in basketball, generally speaking. Mm -hmm. And like, oh, by the way, here's the thing that relates to that. Um, and there's ways you can do it organically. I think there's ways that you can do it uh, in a way that doesn't necessarily feel gross. Um, it's it's hard for me to get over that hump, even even if I'm being thoughtful and and clever about it. Uh, I still know ultimately I'm asking people to buy something, and and it's it's that's that's another one of my little you know mental weaknesses and. It's okay. I think it's okay. I think it's okay yeah. to be like that. And I think it is reasonable um, to just do what you can and not worry about it too much if you fall short there. Um, did I leave some backers on the table? A hundred percent I did because of that limitation. Is that okay with me? Absolutely it is. Yeah. That's, and it's something we struggle with as well here with the mentorship program is, you know, as we start to transition more to becoming like uh, an official nonprofit, that's a hundred percent something we have to get comfortable with. Uh, otherwise, yeah. you know, then we're leaving the people that we want to serve, you know, out in the cold in some respects. Right. Um, so yeah. either us getting more comfortable with that or bringing someone else on um, to handle all that is, is a hundred percent necessary. <laughs> I know I'm, I'm there too. <laughs> right. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Awesome. Uh, so Jay Foolsgard uh, wants to know, uh, what do you find the most stressful and energy consuming during uh, the Kickstarter? Oh, well, I can tell you for sure. In the, the first campaign that we ran, uh, it was it was the Kickstarter page itself, um, which mm. there's two two parts of that 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 were specifically uh, stressful for me. One was just the number, like watching the number. 
I, I couldn't tell you how many times you check and recheck and, um, and then as that relates to stretch goals. So now every time you do a stretch goal, you want to post an update, you want to um, update the page to, to sort of reflect that. Um, sometimes you go past the number of stretch goals you think you need. And so you're thinking about new ones. Like, so, so just managing that aspect of the campaign as it relates to those goals and, and where they are, but also just like it, I eventually figured out how to turn that off in the second campaign or, or in the hoop gods campaign where I wasn't looking at it as much, but that's also because I recognized the weakness from the first campaign. We mm -hmm. had far fewer stretch goals or far, we had far fewer extras in the hoop gods campaign because it was such a pain to try to manage that in the first one. So it was a part of our process to just cut out some of those things that felt very energy consuming and from the first campaign. That's fantastic. And you were so aware of it and uh, and adjusted for later. And so, you know, you felt a little better during during the hoop cats, which is really great to hear uh, that it's not a, oh, you yeah. know, uh, it'll never go away or something. <laughs> Unfortunately, <laughs> no. <laughs> right. <laughs> All right. So uh, Chris is asking a question that is actually seconded uh, by someone else. So um, so sorry if I missed this. If you said this, uh, you may have hard numbers <laughs> of fans before Kickstarter. Uh, but that it's variable. What were your strongest indicators, both in game and promotion, that you were ready for your first Kickstarter? Hmm. We weren't ready for our first Kickstarter. Numbers wise, we were definitely not ready. Um, the success of our first campaign was very, very, very largely uh, due to our, we, we happened to engage with the right people at the right time, I think. And that really boosted our visibility in ways that we could not have predicted. Um, and if it weren't for, I would say like two or three key moments during that campaign, we wouldn't have been successful because we didn't have those raw numbers. Uh, so in a lot of ways we got lucky. Um, I mean, you can call it luck, but at the same time we were, I, one of my purposes, and, and I talk about goals and, and, and kind of purposes and um, my personal goal was slightly different from our campaign goal where i wanted to connect with people in the industry i wanted to do it because i saw a future in the industry for myself even if it wasn't in designing games i still wanted to be a part of it um, mm -hmm. so i was doing a lot of the connection making a lot of connections i was doing a lot of the networking and that ultimately is what led to our success it had nothing to do with the 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 numbers and the fans uh, i want to say we had um we had maybe like 250 people in our email list when we first, when we launched our campaign, which is dismal. Um, and I mean, we, we had just the same number of backers. So obviously we didn't convert a hundred percent. We got a lot of people who we weren't talking to, who weren't a part of our fan base to, to help us out and to um, support. Yeah. So you said you, <laughs> I love that answer. We just weren't ready. Uh, so what made you go ahead and click launch? You know, like if, or is that a sort of hindsight perspective? You know, like at the time, did you think mm -hmm. like, we're totally ready to go? No, again, our purpose wasn't necessarily to, to fund the first time. We wanted that. We structured it in a way that we thought we could, but we were trying to learn. And yeah. we didn't see failure as uh, necessarily a problem. We saw it as a learning opportunity. So we were okay with failing, but we had the game to a place where we felt comfortable showing it to people. Um, we had we had the energy, or we thought we had the energy to sustain a campaign. And mm -hmm. for us, that was basically enough. It was enough to say, "All right, let's push the button and see what happens." Um, and it just so happens to work out, you know, we were, we were doing the right things at the right time. Um, but it, it was not related to, yeah, just the number of people we had in our, in our fan base, in our community. So much of our community building happened during our campaign. And most people would say that's a ridiculous way to fund a campaign <laughs> and they're not wrong. <laughs> uh <-huh. laughs> so Chris has a follow up on your answer then, uh, uh, would you, it be possible to share those two or three moments that defined that success? I, I wish I knew exactly what they were specifically. Mm -hmm. um, I think that 
it it happened it happened to be that we were part of a conversation about representation in the industry that was happening and we were releasing a hip hop game and like nobody had heard of like a hip hop career simulation board game in recent memory and so it it, it sort of snowballed where i was i was chimed into those conversations and it was like hey we're doing something really different here and then i think a few people saw that and were like oh you know what this is actually different this is something we should be paying more attention to like and and they saw i think what they and they, what they saw was the passion that we had behind it and mm -hmm. because it, it's not going to work out like that way for any, for everyone but they recognize how much we love what we were doing. And I think the combination of those two things, and then, yeah, a few people were able to kind of take it and, and run with it. Awesome. Uh, Jay's got another question here. Uh, it kind of rolls into a little bit. Uh, do you have any thoughts on small limited Kickstarters like those from Travis Hill or New Mill Industries, uh, where you might limit the max number of backers or not ship to the US or Europe? Um, yeah, those are beautiful campaigns. I, I, I'm actually inspired to run a campaign like that myself. Um, I think I think they, you know, and it reminds me a lot of what has already been happening for years in tabletop RPG space. Itch.io, mm -hmm. there's thousands of one page RPGs and small RPGs that people put out there and, and for anyone to kind of get and look at. And um, there's a bunch of those Kickstarter campaigns that are very small. It's like, oh, cool. I'll just uh, zines. Zine culture is kind of wrapped up in that. I don't see any reason why lots of people can't do the same thing in board games. Uh, it feels like a natural fit, especially considering like when you're when you are dealing with smaller quantities, things are more expensive. But if you're working in smaller quantities, you can manage a lot of it yourself. You can do a lot of the shipping things. You can cut costs in a lot of other different ways, and still have a campaign that is successful. And you put a game out there, and it's cool, and people like it. And it doesn't take as much effort necessarily as some of the bigger campaigns. So that means maybe you can do more campaigns period because of that <laughs> like i mean new mill is is about to launch another one this week um and they already had a campaign um like right at the end of 2020 i believe mm -hmm. um so you know i think there's plenty of room for that and again why are you doing it if you're right. doing a small campaign understand and un just un know why you're doing it it may be that you are very new to the industry and you just want to show people who you are and you do a campaign of like, look, I'm only making a hundred of these. And you might already have the resources and ready to go, but you're just trying to make a name for yourself. That's a great way to do that. So yeah, understand if if you are going to do that and you have a good reason for it, I, I think it's wonderful. That's fantastic. Uh, well, we are just about at the end of the hour here. Uh, and that is a wonderful place to end on. Uh, Omari, thank you again so much. Uh, for doing this for us and our audience here at the mentorship program, uh, you know we had we had a bunch of people watching. I know you know we get tons of views on these after the replays, uh, you know, because we're international, so the time zone doesn't always work out for everyone. But um, but yeah. the information <laughs> here is it, is timeless. So I, you know, from Grace and I, we really appreciate you coming on and doing this for us. No, I, I really appreciate it, and I, I know you're trying to get me sooner, and I couldn't get it, so I'm just glad we we made it work out this time. <laughs> Absolutely. Absolutely. <laughs> uh, so let me just say to everyone who's watching, uh, next week is going to be uh, one of our releases from Tabletop Network, which is going to be right here on this channel. Uh, it's going to be from Dan Thoreau, and it's called How to Trick a Board Game Critic into Loving Your Game. Um, a wonderfully fun title. Uh, so, uh, And then that will come out uh, on Sunday next week. Uh, and then two weeks from now, we're going to have uh, Luna from Aspie Gamer Girl. Uh, that YouTube channel who's going to talk about, I know, right? Super excited. Uh, she's going to be on to talk about uh, board game uh, photography, uh, how to take great photos of your board games, which is probably pretty important for a Kickstarter, I would imagine. Super important. <laughs> <laughs> so definitely stick around for that. Uh, we'll be doing a Q&A with Luna, and uh, you'll we'll have a way for you to share your photos as well. So bring your camera to that. Um, it'll be really, really fun. 
Uh, so thank you again to our sponsors, uh, New Voices in Gaming and Tabletop Network, and, and of course, Omari. Uh, thank you so much again. It was wonderful, wonderful to have you. Oh, this was great. Thanks, Mike. Absolutely. All right, everyone. We'll see you all next week.